Hello to all, and welcome to the Schriever Space Power Series. I'm Larry Stutzream, Director of Research here at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Well, there is little doubt that the Space Force today must deal with aggressive moves by U.S. competitors. At the same time, the service transitions from operating in a benign domain to one unquestionably contested. This led to General Saltzman's framework of competitive endurance and his number one priority, the development of a combat credible force. As the chief has explained, if you don't have a combat credible force, then you're not likely to deter adversaries. This leads to a change in how Space Force thinks about training. Guardians are no longer trained to simply maintain status quo in orbit. Instead, training seeks to ensure space operators are faced with problems they're likely to see in conflict, allowing the very tactics used in combat to be practiced and validated in a virtual environment. We're very fortunate to have with us today the senior leader responsible for this training transformation. Major General Sean Bratton is the commander of the U.S. Space Forces Space Training and Readiness Command. That's STARCOM for short. It's focused on education, training, doctrine, and test. And in that role, STARCOM works to prepare every guardian to fight and win, develop superior space capabilities, and deliver warfighting solutions to the warfighting commanders. This is perhaps the most exciting period in America's military space enterprise, and perhaps in the entire defenses enterprise. Under General Bratton's leadership, STARCOM is brimming with forward-looking initiatives aimed at preparing guardians to dominate in future conflict, not yesterday's. And most importantly, he's a sun devil like me. We both went to Arizona State. Uh, welcome again, General. It's great to have you back. And I thought we'd start off our time together with you just catching us up since uh, last fall. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Stutz. It's great to be here. Yeah. Great to be with the team. Um, I got a bunch of friends watching me right now, and they'll all give me a scorecard. Of course I'm they will. Sure. Of course. The, uh, I'll tell you, since since last time we were here, it's it's been busy. It it's almost two years into Star yeah. Command, three and right. a half years into the Space Force. Um, that first year of the command, we're really building up uh, our capabilities and very focused on bringing people into the service. How do we make a guardian feel like a guardian, and differentiate ourselves a little bit from our our Air Force history? Um, the second year has been focused on on exactly what you said, credible combat force. What does that mean in training? How do we develop credibility? And we think a lot of that ties directly to readiness. And, and the words right there in Starcom's name, we think we have a key role in building guardians, developing capabilities to establish the credibility associated with the combat force that the Space Force presents to the combat command. So a lot going on. We've had a couple of, couple of new exercises we can talk about in Black black skies um, and where we're going with the sky series. We recently had a Shriver war game uh, in, in the partner to win effort and brought together a lot of folks. So I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that, but it has been just nonstop uh, since day one, but particularly in this last year as we really focus on readiness and development of the force. Yeah, it's just, it's fantastic in the, especially in the last year, how much activity there's been at Starcom. Well, Thanks for those comments, uh, opening comments, and I, I, I'd like to get into some questions and dive into this a little, little further. Um, one foundational uh, principle I think we, we got out of Vietnam was that you do fight like you train, and, and the converse of that is you better train like you fight. And it must be very challenging to do that in a space environment. And I, I note that at our, uh, the Mitchell Space Power Forum, uh, General Saltzman, talked about how domain awareness uh, is, is changing so uh, quickly. Uh, if you took a, a guardian out of initial qualification training a year ago, the uh, nature of the awareness problem has changed by about a third. And uh, that's an incredible rate of tra change. And uh, of course, he said that we have to figure out how to keep up. And I'm wondering how you're doing that. How are you working to ensure the guardians have a environment that's uh, contemporary? Yeah, we, we certainly think about that all the time. And, you, and General Saltzman talks a lot about operational test and training infrastructure. And we can dive deeply into what we're doing to build the range, kind of the, the gym where we take guardians to work out, if you will. But, but maybe more broadly than that, um, 
we, we've had just great success in bringing people into the service, like I mentioned, and developing that culture. First, you have to you have to feel like a guardian. What it, what does it mean to be a member of the Space Force? And the things that the new curriculum we've installed down at basic training, uh, what we're feeding over to ROTC and the Air Force Academy, our presence at the Air Force Academy, all these things come together to bring people into the service. Um, but then to your point, the the understanding of the threat. What is it that we're going to ask guardians to do as part of the joint force? What is specific to the space domain? And how do we how do we think about that and understand the implications uh, for the other domains, air, land, and sea, as a fight were to unfold? And so um, the, I think the building of readiness through the exercise program is key to that. And the, how we think about live virtual simulation uh, activities within training it, is part of that. Uh, but but maybe the foundation of it all is understanding of the threat and really working with the intelligence community and then the, the intelligence guardians within the Space Force to make sure it's broadly understood what we're gonna face within the domain, the capabilities that Russia and China are fielding right now. How do we protect and defend against those so we can deliver effects for the joint force? I mean, all that comes together in Star Command, really both in the classroom, but in our training events that we're putting on primarily for Spock, but not just for, yeah. for Space Operations Command, Spock, um, but also for the new newly established component field commands who are out there in the combat commands trying to trying to understand how we integrate across the joint force. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting, the yeah. quality of people you have. Uh, when you start with threat, I think they're, they understand that as we talk to them very often. Uh, let, let me peel this back a little bit because the technology is important too. Also, uh, Space Force is uh, beginning to invest in the creation of uh, what's called a virtual replica or digital twin of various space capabilities. And it, this, this seems like it's going to be a big advantage in uh, both training guardians and keeping them ready to go. Do you see a challenge to, as just as we said, to maintaining the up-to-date uh, digital twin, um, you know, just as we just discussed? Yeah, there's a there's a lot that goes into that, and we partner pretty closely with um, Space War Fighting Analysis Center SWAC as part of the Space Force, as well as Space Systems Command. So it, it's easy to see when you're fielding a new capability now that that we want to have a digital model of that capability. I want to be able to fly it within the range, um, and and the flow within the Space Force works pretty well. SWAC doing the force design, looking ten years out. Um, begins that process, the development of a digital model for a, a specific spacecraft or a constellation that, that may be fielded. As that works through the acquisition process, fidelity is added to the model, SSC is working with contractors, um, and eventually I, I'll, I'll get my hands on that model, mainly for the test purposes yeah. initially, right. as we think about developmental test, operational test right. activities mm -hmm. in the integrated test force that Starcom runs. Um, but also for training purposes, I need to bring that model into the simulation environment that we're building and be able to fly it out in, for training activities. But but that's only part of the story because that covers the new things that we're going after. Um, we're thinking a lot about how do we bring in existing, exist, existing spacecraft that don't have a digital model. Yeah. And we go back and get at least the right amount of fidelity to be able to fly that within the training environment. Um, as well as as the threats we're going to face, and so a close partnership with the with the intelligence community, uh, with the Delta Seven partners in Spock, which is the intelligence delta within Space Operations Command, as well as Delta Eighteen, the the National Space Intelligence Center that is providing us a lot of this foundational threat information. So all that has to come together, uh, and then we have to be able to fly it in a digital environment that guardians can access. And so some of that exists today. I wouldn't I wouldn't. So, you know, presume to say that we're all the way there. We're getting a lot of help from industry in this area, um, but there's a lot of work to do. And so I think the architecture that we're building will enable this kind of fully realized vision to bring all those things together. And I know you have a tight team to do this, small and, and anxious and yeah. <laughs> ambitious. Well, related to this, uh, I'm curious about the uh, National Space Test and Training Complex, the NSTTC. Uh, can you talk about why this is so different in approach to the other services? How do you see it supporting Guardian training? And then, I, I, just as you said, you can also use that uh, to test capabilities and tactics across uh, the Space Force missionaries, I assume. 
Yeah, the, we, we realized early on, you know, one of the differences in the space domain is that you don't have the ability to carve out a piece of real estate for test and training purposes. Right. So, you know, certainly the Air Force in Southern Nevada, the Army at, at NTC National Training Center in California, uh, the Navy ranges in the ocean, you know, there's ability to sort of set aside some real estate to do test right. and training yes, activities. Yes. Um, there, there's no sovereignty in space. And so we had to think about that a little bit different on how do we do these uh, activities that we need to do to build the credibility of the force to increase readiness, but also be safe and professional in our operations in the space domain. And so the, the National Space Test and Training Complex, and, and like we always do in the DOD, you know, we, we take a bunch of words and we make them into an acronym, so the NSTTC, and then yeah. we turn the acronym into a word, so we call it the, the NISTIC. NISTIC. Um, the NISTIC is a big piece of Starcom's contribution to the overall operational test and training infrastructure that General Saltzman talks about. It is the range. Um, General Moore, my deputy, says all the time, it's it's the gym we go to work out the force. And so we're, we're building that right now. And there, there's already pieces uh, that exist. We've done some live activities, both on orbit as well as in the electromagnetic spectrum with black skies that we can talk about. Um, but the NISTIC is the broad label that we put on the range that we're building. But it's not a it's not a physical piece of real estate that we own. It's really the sensors that we need to observe activity, to make sure that we're being safe and professional, the actual on-orbit capabilities. So if I need to replicate an aggressor capability for tester training, um, that I have that within the red force that, that Starcom fields to challenge our, our blue forces and build that credibility. It, so it's the it's those on orbit capabilities, the ground sensors, and then the infrastructure that ties it all together for command and control and gathering of data, which is particularly important for the test enterprise. Um, and so things that you might see on the ground at places like Edwards or Nellis, you know, we're taking those concepts and then applying them to the NISTIC. No, very good. Um, I, I do want to talk about exercises in a second, but are there any other tools you're looking at in terms of, uh, you know, acquiring capabilities or tools that would uh, improve Guardian training? It, it, absolutely. Uh, you know, almost across the board. I think the big change, um, certainly from when I came up, uh, but even, even in more recent years, is we're shifting back a little bit more to live training. And so... Um, as I came up in the classroom, we had some simulation capability, but there was really a lot of education. There wasn't as much what today I would call training activities. We learned about the space domain, we learned how to operate, but most of it was classroom discussion, seminar style, uh, you know, PowerPoint slides, all the standard things. Now, it, now the discussion is, why aren't we flying a spacecraft in training? Why aren't we getting some sort of reps and sets, some mm -hmm. sorties in, mm -hmm. in the training environment? And, and and that alleviates some of the training burden that we place on the operational units. And so if we can if we can move that back into the training pipeline, I think there'll be value added. The, the, the great example is at the Air Force Academy where they fly Falcon set, right. they build and fly a spacecraft. Um, they're on crew, they understand ground systems, how to schedule an antenna, pastimes, all these sort of fundamental concepts that apply regardless of what spacecraft you end up flying in your career. Um, we think we can bring that back into training uh, through simulation, but also with some live activity. Oh, that's fantastic. And and such a change that's needed so desperately right now based on the threat that you talked about. Well, let's get into exercises and, uh, uh, you know, the value of virtual war games and simulations and exercises. Uh, you recently concluded uh, your Black Skies exercise. You mentioned that. Uh, that was geared toward electronic warfare training. and. It was a, quote, live simulation, I think is the term that's being used. Help us understand what that means and why this type of exercise is so important. Maybe some of the results that came out of the recent one. Yeah, we're, we're excited about the whole Sky series. There's actually a whole framework that we put in place now. The Skies is a big piece of that. Um, space flag that, that many folks are probably familiar with still uh, retains a place in the exercise schedule. So. It's sort of the tactical operational strategic level of exercises. We run the stars and skies events, and then at the tactical level, the the sky or the flag event, space flag at the operational level, and then a, an exercise called Polaris Hammer, which is really for the combat commands, the the new component field commands. So skies in particular 
Um, there, there's different, you know, it'll sound familiar, much like the Air Force flag series, but Black Skies is an electro electromagnetic spectrum exercise, uh, electromagnetic warfare. Red Skies, which we'll do our first one this summer, is a orbital warfare exercise. And then next year we'll do Blue Skies, which is for the cyber warfare team. And so those are each of the main disciplines, This we call them space power disciplines that we work with within the Space Force. And so we've done two Black Skies now, live fire events, um, satellite jamming events, where we think about how do we how do we use offense and defense in the electromagnetic spectrum uh, safe and professionally? How do we defend against it? Uh, when we see people jamming us, how do we geolocate those jammers and understand the capabilities that we have? And so um, mainly in support of, these are in support of SPOC, uh, development of readiness for, for Black Skies for Delta III is the, is the EW, the Electromagnetic Warfare Delta. And so primary training audience is Delta III, but it brings in intel and cyber professionals as well as part of the team and so so we're able to do things both live and simulated uh, that in specifically enhance the readiness of those operators to get to get right at the initial part of the discussion to develop that combat credible force that general saltzman has has charged us to do will, will black skies always be electronic warfare centric it will uh, i think um, I think it'll grow over time and, and maybe a little bit even more live activity than we're doing now. Um, we're talking about where we go in the future with coalition partners as part of these events. So I think there'll be an expansion, but it'll stay within the EW realm. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a very important uh, capability, area of capability the entire Department of the Air Force needs to work on. Yeah. So you may be leading the way to help uh, bring some other aspects of that along. Um, but you're already planning another Black Skies, right? And how's that different or what's, what, what's going on there? We are, we're really um, trying to be responsive to Spock's readiness goals. So as they, as units move in and out of the Space Force generation model, which is our how we present forces to the combatant commands, uh, particularly US Space Command, but, but all the combatant commands, um, we run the Sky Series to meet Spock's training needs. And so as they spit, a unit is spinning up to go into what we call the commit phase, when they're actually working for the combat command, you know, like like any deployer, they have certain certain activities that they need to do and get signed off on. The crew member does. So the Spock Deltas bring those requirements to us, and we deliver for EW specifically in Black Skies the training objectives that they need to meet their readiness goals as they move into that commit phase of the Space Force Generation cycle. Yeah, that's also very very key. Um, I want to shift a little bit and talk about uh, our partners and allies because at Mitchell Institute, uh, every year we get every air chief you can imagine, yeah. and they're now some of them are called air and space chiefs. That's right. uh, of course, you're unique. It sounds, uh, but they are all hungry to talk about space and what what's happening in the United States. I'm sure you're seeing that. Um, so. How, you've got this exercise you participated in. It was Polaris Hammer. Uh, that was uh, Australians participated in it, but it was also fairly complex across uh, U.S. forces, I believe. Can you talk a little bit about that and what some of the takeaways were and what it was like to work with the Australians, perhaps? It, it, I'll tell you, uh, another first for the command. And when you're a brand new command, everything's a first yes, in the early yes, years. Yes. Um, so the, the first Polaris Hammer, uh, Delta One, the, the 392nd Training Squadron, Combat Training Squadron, ran this. But this is more at the st operational strategic level. And so um, working for General Mastelier, who is the component commander out of Indo-PACOM for Space Forces Indo-PACOM that just stood up last year. Uh, we brought Polaris Hammer as a training event for his staff and the Australians came to. And how do we think about command and control of Space Forces in particular in support of Indo-PACOM? Um, what forces might be assigned uh, directly to Indo-PACOM in that case? What's the coordination that occurs with U.S. Space Command as well as with our allies? And Polaris Hammer is really built to get after that. How do we think about command and control, the orders process? What's the reach back into the, the Space Force Command and Control Deltas, Delta V, and, and the new Delta 15? And so um, being able to provide a venue for General Mastelier to think through that as a brand new component commander was really the benefit. So we think uh, Polaris Hammer will continue. We'll, we'll, we'll put that on anytime one of the component field commands asks for sort of that level of exercise to work through whatever their training objectives are. But most likely 
working through the command and control of space forces for that particular combatant command. Yeah. Did you, is it a challenge to integrate space capabilities now than it, now that there's so much energy and understanding of the threat, that's still in growth, do you think? I, th I think the challenge is uh, partly there's so much that's new. There's a there's a really still a new command command. There's a brand yeah, new service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the service is going you know as fast as we can go on uh, new field commands, new component field commands out there. Space Forces and OPAC being an example. And so the the pace of the change is so rapid. Um, you know, by the time you design and execute an exercise, you know, there's a, there's something new that's already happened. So we have to be really agile as yeah. we build this all out. Um, that maybe is the, is the great challenge on how do you deliver current um, training that meets the needs of the commander who's asking for it in this pace of rapid change. But, but so far, we've been able to do it. Um, I think our small size helps us be a little bit more agile than maybe if we were a much larger force. Yeah, I understand. Well, I'd like to, to uh, seg a little bit to talk about doctrine because it's an important part yeah. of, of what you're working in. And uh, you've been putting out doctrine on everything from personnel to sustainment, it seems. Everything being new, I suppose. Uh, you talked at the Space Symposium about uh, how it's being developed and you spoke of a campaign of learning because unlike, uh, say for example, on the Air Force side of things, that doctrine comes out of experience, warfighting experience, and we just haven't seen that depth uh, in space yet. So this campaign of learning, uh, could you talk about that? How you're going to maybe validate doctrine that's not coming out of operational experience? Yeah, well, that's, that's the exact challenge with the doctrine front is, you know, normally you develop your doctrine from your warfighting experience and we've never fought in space. We we hope to never fight in space, but we certainly have to be ready to. And so we can't wait until after that fight to right. develop the doctrine. So you got to come up with a new way to do it. And so uh, the campaign of learning really gets after uh, we have an idea of, of, of how we might fight or, or, for example, we'll talk about key terrain in space, like what orbital regime is the most valuable and how do we think about that? And so we call that a concept. It's just an idea that we have. We don't know if it's right or wrong. Um, but we want to try it out. And so we take those concepts and we run them through the campaign of learning. And the campaign of learning can be different for each concept, but generally involves some wargaming, may involve some actual exercise activity, certainly involves just some intellectual rigor where we go to go to partners and friends who help us think through, is this concept viable? And places like, you know, SWAC, the Space Warfighting Analysis Center, um, who help us think it through and then that comes together and if something makes it through the campaign of learning and proves to be a viable idea we think it, at that time then we can consider that just some nascent doctrine for the space force and so we we have we have published some doctrine but we have not published a, a 3.0 our operational doctrine that says how we fight in space because we're still working through this this campaign of learning right now we have we have a draft document we're actually um i worked uh talked to the Commandant down at SAS, the School of Advanced Air and Space mm -hmm. Studies, yep. um, down at Maxwell. And so the, the graduating class, the guardians in the graduating class, we're gonna keep them after school for a little bit and they're gonna scrub our, our draft doctrine document again, get some sort of outside eyes on it that haven't been involved in the process. Also, you know, our, our bright and shiniest new graduates of that, that great schoolhouse down there, um, and so they're going to take a look at that document over the summer as part of the campaign of learning for the concepts within it. And then we'll see if that if the if we feel good enough about the doc, the doctrine within there or the concepts within there that it passes muster to become maybe our first three dot doctrine document. Yeah, that's, that's very good. You know, you're when the capstone doctrine came out, that was pretty exciting. Yes, sir. Uh, and in fact, here at Mitchell Institute, the, our Space Power Advantage Re Center of Excellence and my space, uh, we use that term advantage because it was listed in the, uh, given in the capstone document about 25 times, which was really refreshing to think of that mindset from the very start from the capstone was about the advantage of space power. Uh, uh, the, the guardians believe it and that's important. Yeah, it's, there's a funny story about that, that document when I, when, General Raymond pulled me aside and said, hey, I think I'm going to, you know, have you come over and run Starcom. And, and, and that all worked out. There wasn't a lot of written guidance on what the command should be. There was, you know, as you can imagine, a couple PowerPoint briefs that mostly were about structure of the field commands sure, yeah. and what the Space Force would look like. 
the, the only real written guidance with it was within the capstone document. And it really said just two things. One, it said establish independent professional military education for the Space Force. It was a very specific task. And then the other was, you know, the field command would be stood up by September of uh, 21, which we made. Um, and so uh, the key, there was a lot of great stuff in that document. For me, as the first commander, it gave me two, like, very specified tasks for my boss to go do. Uh, and we met both those goals, uh, I'm happy to say. But, uh, yeah, that, that document holds a, a place near and dear in my heart. I can imagine. For the help. only guidance I had. <laughs> <laughs> from zero, uh, Sean, you've had you've had an amazing few years at Starcom. Very very productive, and you talked about professional military education, and uh, you you've taken some very creative courses. You know this uh, deal you have with uh, John Hopkins uh, for PME. I, I'm 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 curious why you took that vector instead of the traditional build a schoolhouse somewhere in in uh, some state somewhere. Uh, you know, and what. Have you learned some stuff from this? Is it working out? Yeah, okay? we have. We're, I'm really excited. The first class will start this summer at um, Johns Hopkins University, the School of Advanced International Studies, or SICE. That's it's right here in D.C. And so, uh, for Officer PME, we're excited about that. I, I did have again. It was the it was the one thing that was written down and go do this. The Starcom will establish independent PME for the Space Force, and for Officer PME, we were able to we were able to build this partnership with Johns Hopkins. We, we did some initial analysis and we had a lot of help from Air University on this, uh, thinking through what's the right fit for the Space Force. And one of the courses of action, of course, was we can build Space Force University um, and stand up our own independent schoolhouse. But we're such a small service, it just it just didn't make sense, sort of almost you know, fiscal responsibility wise, it didn't make sense to do that. The resources it would take to to build and establish an independent school like that. Um, just did, weren't the right fit for this this service. And so sure. uh, we, we met with a lot of universities. We put a request for a proposal out. Johns Hopkins ended up being the the one, and, and we're really excited about where the partnership will go. This uh, The first students show up here in July uh, for, for the uh, intermediate level education, senior level ed education, so command and staff and war college. Uh, in July in this new program, we'll teach the space curriculum, Johns Hopkins, they have access to that course catalog and the, and the, just the, the great quality of education that comes from that institution. So we're really excited about that for the officer side. At the same time, we're working hard on enlisted PME. The, the Vossler NCO Academy came over and is part of Starcom and Delta 13. And so mm -hmm. introducing new curriculum for the enlisted force. Uh, more work to do there. I think we owe them a little bit more than we've given for the on the enlisted force side now that we got JHU up and running. And then we still have to figure out sort of our primary level. What are we going to do for a captain's course? Um, today we still send uh, folks to squadron officer school down at Maxwell. It's a great institution. We're, we're doing the analysis on what needs to happen down there. And there's a there's a bunch of captains just leading the way on that, as you can imagine. And then the same for, for the early enlisted education. What's the right fit for the Space Force? So that's work that's still ahead of us. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that, I think, in this next yeah. year. Do, do, you, do you see uh, the Academy continuing to be a large part of feeding your officer? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, again, the size of our service, there's no, uh, you know, there's no discussion, that, and I don't think any chance that we would, we would go a different way. The Air Force Academy produces officers for both services, just like ROTC does. And we draw from both those sources. About 100 uh, brand new lieutenants come out of the Air Force Academy, so about 10% of the graduating class in any given year. And, and they are they are just delivering a great quality of education up there, as you know. And, and they have embraced the Space Force for sure. There's space curriculum. We're working closely with the Astro Department. Starcom has a detachment up there to be able to in interact with the students who are who are trying to figure if they want to go into the Air Force or the Space Force, and yeah. so. So you spend a lot of time up there. I do, yeah. and it's yeah, uh, it's beers. rejuvenating every oh. time uh, every time <laughs> I go up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let let me step back to the uh, PME again at John Hopkins. So, do you seek any different outcomes than traditional PME does, or, or I mean, there's leadership content, there's. Uh, uh, heritage content, there's uh, technical content, but are you looking for something different? I, I think there's a couple things. One, um, we absolutely have to meet the joint requirements right. uh, yeah, for yeah. JPME, and so the joint staff puts out a, a document that all the services 
um, so adhere to for that joint accreditation. We will absolutely do that. And so that's why there'll be, you know, soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines that come through our program with guardians. And we'll continue to send guardians to Army and Navy and Air War College National, all those places. Um, that helps us on the joint, the credibility on the joint side and meeting the requirements that the joint staff lays. I think it does. I think the policy um, expertise that SICE offers, the, the School of Advanced International Studies at, at Johns Hopkins, um, is really something that, that raises the bar. It, you know, it, yeah. it is an internationally yeah. recognized institution. Of course. Yeah. And the ability for our students to interact with the rest of the student body. And so, you know, a, a guardian or, or anyone going through the program will be able to choose from, if they meet the prerequisites, you know, take electives across the Johns Hopkins course catalog. Yeah. So, so potentially very technical things uh, up at some place like APL, but but within SICE itself, just the interaction with the rest of the student body, I think, will be very positive as those folks uh, build relationships, and then and then the rest of the student body body goes on into industry or into government service. I think also the connections maybe will prove to be powerful that we make. Them. Yeah, no, that's outstanding. Uh perspective. Um, I've got a couple more questions, but I, w I do want to remind our audience that uh, you can uh, ask here in a little bit some audience questions. Use your raise the hand function in the Zoom app, or you can type in a question in the uh, Q&A, and I'm looking through them right now. There's, there's a few here we'll get to in a second. Uh, as we talk, you were talking a little bit about, you know, production of officers, and we talked a little bit about the, the, the academy. Um, you recently uh, graduated your first uh, Space Force flight from OTS, and you had your first Space Force flight from basic military training. And um, any lessons there? Uh, uh, and are you going to adjust that in any way? Well, I, I think um, tons of lessons every day for sure. We're, we're super proud of both those institutions. OTS down at Maxwell has really, um, has really gone out of their way to help the Space Force. And so... Um, and so that first flight officers were, were proud of those guys. I got to go down and meet with them. The, again, the energy in the room of all those uh, at the time soon to be and now second lieutenants uh, was palpable. The, I think it, the same at basic training. You know, we had that first flight graduate last summer. We've had several since. I've been, been able to go to a couple of the graduations. A, a lot of this comes into play on the culture and identity piece. Yeah, on, right. and, and we spent a, a lot of time the first year thinking about how do we make a guardian a guardian? What does that mean? And, and we talked about uh, all my Texas A&M friends are tired of me asking them questions about, you know, why are you the way you are? Because they're so, right. you know, that institution generates a sense of a pride and connection to yeah. the institution. And yeah. so um, the Air Force Academy, I think, does the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many alumni that come back and live in close proximity to the institution and so understanding what happens at the school to engender that feeling of commitment and connection um, and then incorporating that in basic training so we we just had a uh, basic training graduation a few weeks ago and we we i probably talked we probably talked about this before but the patching ceremony and so anytime someone comes into the space force they get a space force patch of course but they, they don't get a brand new one. They get a patch that someone else has worn. And usually it comes with a handwritten note that, you know, I wore this patch. Here's what it means to me. Um, so maybe some advice. And then, you know, I'm now giving this patch to you. And then somewhere down the line, you will give this patch and pass it on to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a simple ceremony that we came up with it, that we do started at basic training, but has now spread across the whole Space Force for everyone coming in. That's great. Um, that engenders that feeling of connection immediately. Welcome to the service. You're valued. Uh, we want you here. So at the last basic training graduation, we have a, a military training instructor down there, Senior Master Sergeant Chua, who uh, has been been there since the beginning and is one of the, you know, foundational members of Starcom. His son graduated basic oh, training, my and, yeah. and Sergeant Chua placed he took you know his own patch and put it on his son yeah. and just. Just a very emotional, palpable moment, um, but symbolic of what happens every time someone comes into the Space Force. Yeah, very, very well said. Um, last thing on, on this, you know, it's not your job jar necessarily, but, you know, all military leaders are concerned about what's happening with recruiting and retention right now. Yeah. Uh, just a lot of factors, you know, that we could discuss. But, you know, you look at the Army uh, just announced yesterday, really not going to hit their numbers again this year. Navy 
8,000 sailors short of 40,000 uh, 40, goal. Air Force still has a 2,000 pilot shortage that just doesn't want to get fixed. And, uh, and you know, Space Force has a need for some very talented uh, folks to come in, you know, kind of a uppercut of, you know, recruiting stock and you got to keep them for a while. So what do you see as challenges across the leadership structure of or team of the Space Force? You know, what are, are there some opportunities or what are some challenges in keeping talent or recruiting talent? Yeah, I think the the recruiting side is less of a of an issue for the Space Force part because of our small size. I mean, we bring in uh, this year, it'll be about 500 plus enlisted yeah. members, 300 officers. We, we meet those goals. It's, it's not a challenge. The Air Force Recruiting Service takes great care of us, as does ROTC and the Air Force Academy. I think the interesting thing will be in the retention piece. So we're, you know, we're three and a half years in, and so it's a little early to really understand what our retention looks like and, and what do we need to do for members to get them to stay in the service. I get asked this a lot. I was even uh, Chief Sabias and I, the senior enlisted leader for StarCraft, we were at basic training talking to these brand new guardians in about their fifth week of training. And and one of those brand new guardians, you know, just he's talking to two star general, no, no qualms. He's like, what are you going to do to keep me in the service? Um, you know, I went through basic training. I would have been terrified to speak in that situation. And so it's a, it's a, it's a comment both on the, the quality of the member we're bringing in. They are not afraid to ask tough questions. Um, but it's also a, a very legitimate thing in what are we going to do to retain him? And so we're working hard in, in training and education. I think that's a, those are career long things. Yeah. You're not done with training at the end of basic training or even initial skills. Starcom owes you training throughout your career mm -hmm. and there has to be opportunity. Uh, I think the same for the education, continuing education throughout a career. Will that help with retention? I think absolutely it will. Opportunity leads people to want to stay with an organization. And so we can create a lot of opportunity for guardians. We do that through weapon school, test pilot school, mm -hmm. The super coder program, and so uh, you know the, the um, SAS grads. I mean, all those opportunities that you that you'll have throughout your career as a guardian. I think it's too soon to know is that enough. What else do we need to do? And so we are thinking about that. We're certainly not not you know resting on our laurels as we as we consider how to retain the force throughout their entire career. Yeah, very good. Well, let me uh, close out this segment. It's been fantastic to yeah. talk to you, General. Uh, best of luck to you, uh, and uh, boy, what a couple of years you've had. It's, it's been, been fantastic. Incredible. Yeah, it's been really neat. So we've come to our audience section uh, segment here, and uh, I just want to remind everybody in the audience uh, that uh, when I call on you, uh, please uh, uh, identify yourself, unmute your mic, and then state your question. Uh, and of course, use the raise the hand function if you want to if you want to ask the question live. Otherwise, go ahead and type in a question in the Q and A. So, uh, General Bratton, if you're uh, ready for this, we got Frank Wolf. Frank. Yeah. Uh, hi, General. Um, I just wondered if you uh, can discuss a little more on Black Skies and uh, what you learned um, this year uh, as opposed to last year's exercise uh, that might be different and. Um, just in terms of this year's uh, live uh, simulation exercise, um, I wanted to see how how you really can glean lessons learned, given that I guess the 42 targets were were simulated. Um, so I just wondered again on, on those those questions, basically what happened, what the lessons learned were that were different from last year, and and how you can really glean lessons learned, given that those targets, the, the more than two dozen, I guess were were uh, were simulated. Yeah, Frank. Thanks. It, um, thanks for the question. The, the we, we're learning a lot in Black Skies. You know, the the primary purpose of that is training objectives that we get from Space Operations Command to prepare that force as part of the Space Force Generation Cycle. Um, and so that you know, we're working with uh, Trigger Fernangle is the commander of Delta Three out there. Um, his folks are. Are pros that they're operating their systems. There's no question about that. A lot of our learning is in the command and control side on how do we command and control multiple systems, um, potentially across several AORs, and how do we think think about that with the command and control centers that we have today. So 
you know, Delta 5 out of Vandenberg running the, the CSPOC and then the JTFSD folks are now Delta 15. And so, um, and so that, that's the majority of our lessons learned were in, this, in the C2 function, if you will. There's always lessons learned on the Intel side on how do we think about um, targeting, how to, our understanding of the adversary, our ability to move information rapidly across the enterprise uh, that in, the, in the electromagnetic warfare uh, suite, if you will, between offensive and defensive capabilities. And so I, I'd say that's mostly where our lessons learned were. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Sure. Very good. We have a question here from Al Moore. Uh, he's with General Dynamics Mission Systems. We know Al. Uh, he says, uh, what outcomes are you looking for from the upcoming NSTTC, NISTIC, uh, Industry Days in June? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, Industry Day, I, I didn't mention it. My my range guys would be unhappy if I didn't. So thanks for bringing it up. Uh, June 22nd, 23rd in Colorado Springs. Um, we're going we're gonna to walk through our gaps on, on the NISTIC build out. And so within the broad operational test and training infrastructure, and then specifically for the, the NISTIC, there are some areas that we absolutely need help from industry on. Um, part of it is, and just a, a little bit of background for those who aren't familiar. So the NISTIC breaks into several sections, uh, electromagnetic warfare, orbital warfare, uh, cyber warfare, but really the architecture that holds it all together is the digital infrastructure that'll let us do test and training activities um, across, across those spectrums. And so how do I bring capabilities together and then, um, and then let it unfold in a live virtual constructive way? And so we haven't quite crack the code on that completely. We have some simulation capability. I think that's an area where we need more help. We have um, sort of some underlying infrastructure and we have a vision of where we want to go for OTTI broadly, um, but it's an area where we're going to need industry's help. And then we absolutely need, particularly on the test side of the house, um, some additional sensor capability to be able to observe activities on orbit in sort of a dedicated test environment. We've got lots of sensors that work for the operational command now doing space domain awareness, but, but when you're conducting a sensitive test activity, you know, the ability to stare into space for, you know, hours, days, or longer um, will, will I mean, we have to have some dedicated sensors for test activities. And so I think there's some gaps there, and we'll walk through that all at the industry day. Sounds great. Uh, let me ask a, a couple other uh, questions that came in here. Stand by. Will the program at John Hopkins University also include the curriculum officers currently get in PME for joint qualification? I think you refer to that. Yes. But the question is, what is the plan for Space Force officers to become fully joint qualified officers. Is that happening or not? It, yeah, it, it is happening and it's the, it's the same plan the other services use. So the, the Joint Staff J7, we work closely with them on the accreditation of the program. So they're looking at our curriculum now, they've seen our desired learning objectives, and we have to meet those standards. And so the accreditation by the Joint Staff takes about a year. We have regular meetings with them throughout and they sort of observe that first iteration that's going to happen starting this summer. And so they'll watch us, but uh, it is absolutely our intent and we're working closely with them to ensure that we get JPME 2 accreditation specifically. And then, uh, of course, the assignment within a, jo a joint job, whether one of the command commands or on the joint staff, you know, we value that experience. Those two together create joint qualified officers. Another uh, question here uh, pertains to uh, weapons instructor courses. Max Harper yeah. asks, will you continue to have one space weapons instructor course, or is there a plan to separate them out by mission area to include cyber and intel? Yeah, there, there's, um, we talk about this a lot, and there's work to do. So the 328th out at Nellis right now, um, uh, you know, runs the weapon instructor course, produces weapons officers for the Space Forces Guardians uh, for space operations. So we do have the ability to send Guardians through the, the Cyber and Intel weapon instructor course at Nellis, that, the, that those Air Force squadrons. I think um, I, we're looking at, uh, in particular, a, an advanced instructor course for cyber that, that could in the future become a separate Space Force uh, weapons instructor course. We have to have that conversation 
with the, the warfare center and with the weapons school itself. But um, but right now that the so right now we continue to produce weapons officers or have the ability of all three. But I think we're going to need some increased capacity for intel and cyber that maybe doesn't exist today. Yeah. So we're going to get after that. Now within the space operations uh, course, uh, the weapons instructor course right now, we ha there are now tracks for orbital warfare, electronic warfare, space battle management that are done within the 328th today. So there, there's constant change out there, um, as you know, and that has been one of the recent changes as we think through what does the Space Force need. Mm -hmm. We have a question from, uh, uh, let's see, from uh, Inside Defense. Is there any update on using ACT demo to attract and retain talent and non-traditional candidates? The, um, the the whole Space Force is moving to ACT demo and uh, I, I've got, you know, now about a year and a half's experience with it when we first converted uh, our folks and then now all our new hires. And so, great program. We're getting great support out of the AQ community, SAF AQ community, sort of holding our hand as we go through this and build up some experience within the Space Force. So. Of course, Space Systems Command has been on ACT demo the whole time, uh, so we're using it. For I'm not sure the meaning of non-traditional candidates, but um, we are using all the the tools that ACT demo ACT demo brings to us to bring in the best civilian talent that we can. Yeah, it's curious, you know, because because you're you're bringing together expertise from the other services. Is is that been a problem, or are they? Coming together? No, it's coming together for the for the inter service transfers. The military members coming over. Um, it, it one the experience they bring is outstanding. Immediate impact on the culture of the space force. How we think about things. Challenging, you know, long held beliefs, um, and bringing new and fresh ideas. So it's really powerful impact that the inter service transfers have. I'd say we have learned, and and really those those folks who came over the early days. You know some tough lessons on how we think about uh, the sort of the administrative side of transferring from one service to another, mm -hmm. really from outside of the Department of the Air Force into the Department of the Air Force, um, and records. We, we've gone just to great lengths to ensure that the consideration for command and school and promotion boards is fair and equitable. And the, the numbers show actually the inter-service transfers are doing really well in those areas. But but we did we did put them maybe maybe unknowingly or unintentionally through a lot of pain on the sort of the records management side to ensure that, that all their paperwork came over from their service. Yeah. The systems just between the services don't Come talk on. well to each other, the personnel systems, and uh, Miss Kelly and the S1 team have been just heroes, and, and we there's more work to do there. I, I'll tell you on the training side, we stood up a very specific class called the Guardian Orientation Course for the inner service transfers to sort of um, walk them through some of these things. Here's how you know, uh, officer rating works within the Space Force. Here's how promotions work. That, I think, was a was an early effort and was successful. I think more is needed um, for members coming into the service to make sure that they are welcome and connected from day one. We talked earlier uh, before we came on here about um, we have a couple multi-domain projects, uh, one being done by uh, Blue Heron, yeah. one of our senior resident fellows. And what's interesting about it is you can talk about in the technology side, the operational side, uh, closing a kill chain across domain or, or using multi-domain. But what's happening with the rest of the enterprise? And is it also being looked at as far as making sure all that is ready to support the war fighting piece? And it's interesting that that the services uh, don't transfer very well in, in terms of the personnel side. Yeah. No, I, it's a great, it's, it's a great point. Um, I think the, you know, the each service makes a decision where the resource goes, and sometimes maybe the personnel systems uh, yeah. fall down, and then and then the humans pay the price. We're trying to fix that. It's uh, it's it's funny you mentioned Blue. I'll tell a story about him because oh good, uh, so you can use a little yes. He and I were in in Iraq together on the ground out there. So talk about multi-domain expertise. He has it because he spent a lot of time with the Marines out west. Um, and uh, and we spent about six months there, but he got stuck with us in Baghdad for a time, and he would he would try and get fly out every every night. They would fly out to Al Assad, and he kept trying to get a flight out there, and he never did. And um, and so it, you know it got to the point where he was we sort of adopted him as part of the staff, and so we made this big going away video, and Blues featured pr predominantly in it, or prominently in it. 
even though he was never actually assigned with us, he was just trying to get back out to the Marines out west. But a uh, great officer, yeah, he's a hero. Yeah, he is. He's doing really well. Uh, there's a, a couple of cleanup questions here on PME also. Distance learning version of PME? At yeah, some point? I get that a lot. We're, um, it, it'll come in time, but it, we do not have it today. And, and we probably won't start working on it soon. Um, right now, the, you know, the the AU teammates have, have been great to us. Uh, Air Command and staff and Air War College still available via distance learning uh, through the Air Force. We, I think we, we have a little bit of work to do to make sure, you know, the, the same is true for the other service distance learning capabilities. Um, I think we'll come back around after we get a class or two under our belt and talk to Johns Hopkins about distance learning opportunities. Yeah, at some point, yep. yeah. Uh, this uh, question uh, is, is of interest. Uh, we were just talking a little bit tangentially about it. Has, it's, it's worded very, uh, you have to listen to this, has the establishment of the Space Force as a separate service impacted the ability to integrate space capabilities, services, and uh, threats into joint exercises? And I guess you could look at that as, is it better or has it been problematic? Yeah, I, I take, that is a great question. There's a lot uh, to think through there. So not as specifically we continue to participate in all the joint events, and we now have um, some joint accredited events ourselves, Space Flag being one of those. And so, um, and so I think it, there, there hasn't been an impact in the, the participation of joint events. Now, I would say the demand level is high and the Space Force is small, so we're, we're doing everything we can, um, particularly in Starcom, the range and aggressors, I mean, they're continuously tasked. And in many cases, it's to support the, the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps. And so we're putting guardians out there to participate. I think one thing that has happened that we're, we are paying a close attention to within the Department of the Air Force is in some places, the space expertise has left or, or has drawn down. And I'll point to the Air Force Warfare Center as one of these because Basket Cunningham and I have talked about this. Um, he's like, hey, there's no, you know, the, there's no more... 13 S's, right, now Guardian, space operators, but there, there's no more space folks um, at the Warfare Center, and there used to be quite a few, because I pulled them all to Starcom when we created the, uh, the right. field command, sure. those billets transferred to the Space mm -hmm. Force. And so there are a couple places, at, um, at my discussion with Afotech, uh, with Lou Rawls down there, the same, and so there's a couple places where w w we're going back and making sure we have the right expertise in place. And so it may be that I put I put a few positions out at the Warfare Center. One, because I need to interact with the with the air domain in operational test and, and the training activities. But they also need some space expertise for their events. And so we're talking about it in some places we're going back within the Department of the Air Force and reestablishing some connections that maybe inadvertently got broken. Um, I, I think we've identified where those are, but in the greater joint community, I think we're well plugged in. I think the establishment of the component field commands will only reinforce our integration with the joint community. Yeah, no, that's that's very smart. Let's see, we have um, a question, kind of give you a little down tempo here and talk. Um, thank you for taking the time for Martin. Uh, what do you think about professional reading? Uh, are you reading anything now, and what are you attracted to? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, I'm a big fan of professional reading, Martin, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just had this question, I was briefing the Squadron Commanders course um, the other day, and someone asked me the exact same question, you know, what are you reading right now? And so I'll tell you, um, I just finished, I got one episode left, actually, a podcast, so not reading, but uh, The Prince that The Economist put out. I got that tip from, from actually General Brown. I think it's on his reading list, but I heard him talk about it. And so just an outstanding uh, podcast about China and Xi Jinping specifically. Um, so that's on my reading list. I, I'm, I'm reading a, a Dr. Ward, who came and talked to us um, at the Starcom Commanders Conference, has a book on China that I'm reading right now. And then, you know, I'm usually reading, you know, as, uh, for just for kind of leisure and pleasure reading some science fiction book or some leadership book. And uh, and so I've always got something on the shelf in addition to the, the work, directly work-related stuff. Uh, I'm reading The Frontiersman. I've decided to take a break from military stuff for a couple months. Uh, and it's about the uh, first, uh, you know, pioneers into Ohio. It's pretty, oh, no kidding. pretty interesting book. I read, um, not to get too far off track, but the, 
some Stephen Ambrose, like nothing like it in the world, the establishment of the Intercontinental Railroad. Oh, what an amazing book. It, yeah. it, I mean, you really got to want it because there's a lot of information in that book. And it's pretty dense, but it, amazing story. It is, yeah. it is. Um, we're bouncing around here. A few last questions. Uh, NCO, you talked a little bit about NCO PME, of course, but uh, how much will continue to be done by the USAF or the Air Force side, I guess? And will there be a complete transformation or, or transfer at some point? Um, and then it, are Community College of the Air Force opportunities still open? There's another question that asks about AFIT and other opportunities like that. Are they open to Space Force yeah, uh, officers and enlisted? All those things are open. So we, we maintain Community College of the Air Force accreditation with our courses. Um, and we think a lot about that before we make changes because we don't want to break that accreditation, especially for our inter service transfers who are coming over. And so, so yes, we're still, still part of the CCF and intend to be for at least for the, um, as far as I can see. The, um, and we still send people through AFIT. They run all the advanced degree programs, um, do a great job, and they're taking great care of us for advanced degrees. And so, uh, so absolutely still part of AFIT. So uh, on the NCO Academy, so the Vossler NCO Academy, which is located at Peterson, actually transferred into the Space Force. So there's one NCO Academy within the Space Force, um, and that's Vossler. And we run our NCO and senior NCO course there. Now we're still closely tied uh, to the AU team, to Barnes, and uh, on the curriculum. So we've added Space Force curriculum. It's, I think, mostly Guardian instructors, soon to be entirely Guardian instructors there. Uh, but I think there's, a, we'll continue to work on that curriculum to deliver what we need for the, for the NCOs and senior NCOs. There's a question here, uh, and we just coincidentally talked about this before, before uh, we came on, and that is, are there challenges in bringing together the, the various operators of satellite constellations or satellites uh, as a warfighting team? There is, I, I'll tell you even more broadly, the bringing together the space, cyber, and intelligence teams. And so we are, we are thinking about this a lot right now, and we're about to actually publish the training vision and roadmap, which will, will articulate how we're gonna do this as the service. But. Um, I think the integration of the disciplines, you know, right now we tend to train them in, in individual groups, especially space, cyber, and intel. I think we, we don't operate that way, though. Spot, on a spot crew, a space operations uh, command crew, usually there is representative space, cyber, and intel on the crew force. And so, it, again, I've shifted training burden inadvertently um, to SPOC that, that it, I think STARCOM needs to do a better job at. And so we're talking about how do we integrate training across space, cyber, and intel, but also to, to the question's point, the operators of those systems. And so we cer that certainly happens at Skies events and Space Flag right. and Shreve Award right. Game and all those things. Um, but I think we need to bring that back into the training pipeline so we're training the crew force, not individual members of the crew force, but we're training as a crew. And so we have the vision to do that. There's some work we need to do to get there um, that's ahead of us still, but we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, one last question, sure. uh, and I'll read it. The Space Force is a very small service. In order to address all the responsibilities with a small pool of people, do you see a need to move away from specialty career fields toward a qualification approach, for example, where a guardian might be qualified for cyber operations and intelligence? Y yes. <laughs> yes, okay. absolutely. Um, it, it's like... Uh, uh, I don't know who asked it, but in the in the training vision and roadmap, we refer to that concept as major minor, and so you know, similar to a college, you might have a major and a minor in college. Uh, I think everyone will have a major, whether that's in space cyber or intel acquisition engineering, and then a minor in another discipline. In it, today, we would call that cross training within the, that the Air Force has done for years. I, I did that myself as both a communications officer and then a space operations officer. And so we're gonna need everyone to be sort of multi-qualified um, yeah. in that major minor concept. I think we'll also apply it um, to the space power disciplines. And so you might have, your major might be orbital warfare with a minor in electronic warfare. and so. I think we're building the training pipeline um, in the training vision document that'll allow us to do that. It, there's, there's some we got to think about instructors and facilities and okay. just the the, nat, the things you need to create that environment. But that's absolutely where we're going to go. 
Well, uh, this has been an incredible discussion, uh, General. We really appreciate uh, the work you've done since you've been at Starcom, um, a pioneer. Yeah, you're right guy for the right place, in my opinion. And I think a lot of people uh, understand how you do this with a small staff and uh, not the biggest budget in the world yet, but uh, I'm sure that'll be forthcoming as more people understand the threat and where we need to go in uh, Space Force. So thank you for being here today. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, from all of us uh, at uh, MI Space, uh, have a great space power kind of day. <laughs>